Although CPR can be challenging when you're the first and perhaps only person on the scene, remembering the key points will see you through. 1. Assess the situation. 2. Call for assistance and equipment. 3. Start chest compressions quickly and continue with as little interruption as possible. And 4. Apply a defibrillator quickly so you can find and treat any correctable dysrhythmias. Specific steps in responding to cardiac arrest vary somewhat depending on the equipment and number and type of personnel available. The procedures described here are for adults and children aged 9 years and older. After cardiac arrest, it's essential to begin CPR immediately and continue until spontaneous breathing and palpable pulse return or a trained provider determines that further attempts are futile. First, assess the situation. If you find an unresponsive person or witness a sudden collapse, assess responsiveness by shaking or tapping the person. Shout, for example, are you okay? Don't begin resuscitation if the person is breathing, coughing, or moving normally. If there's no response, check breathing and pulse. Most healthcare providers take too long to check for a pulse. Take no more than 10 seconds to check for both pulse and respirations. Check for a carotid pulse by palpating between the sternocleidomastoid muscle and the lateral border of the laryngeal cartilage. Don't use your thumb. At the same time, check for breathing by looking for chest movement. Some clinicians listen at the mouth and nose and feel for breath on their cheek. If the person has a definite pulse but is not breathing or is only gasping, provide only rescue breathing. If you don't find a definite pulse within 10 seconds, start chest compressions. Next, before you start resuscitation, call for assistance. If you're alone, shout for nearby help and use a mobile device to activate the emergency response system appropriate for your location, which in the U.S. is the number 911. Hospitals typically have their own response system. If you know a defibrillator is located nearby, retrieve it, even if you have to leave the patient. If you're not alone, tell someone else to activate the emergency response system and retrieve a defibrillator while you begin CPR. If a defibrillator is available immediately, use it before starting CPR. Otherwise, begin CPR but apply a defibrillator as soon as one becomes available. Early defibrillation may promptly convert ventricular fibrillation or pulseless ventricular tachycardia to a perfusing rhythm. We will first demonstrate chest compressions and rescue breathing. While awaiting arrival of the defibrillator, do chest compressions by placing the heel of one hand on the lower half of the sternum and the heel of your other hand on top of the first hand. Kneel over the person to position your body directly over your hands. Do 30 chest compressions. Compression should be fast and hard at a rate of at least 100 compressions per minute. Press down at least 2 inches, 5 centimeters, into the chest. After each compression, let the chest rise or recoil fully to allow the heart to fill completely before the next compression. During a compression cycle, compression time should equal release time. Count the 30 compressions out loud. After 30 compressions, give two rescue breaths. Cover the patient's mouth tightly with your mouth, pinch the nose closed, keep the chin lifted and head tilted, exhale a moderately deep breath into the patient's mouth. Rescue breaths should be slow and each take about a second and make the chest rise. If an oropharyngeal airway and bag valve mask apparatus are available, use them if you have a second rescuer and at least one of you is capable of using them. Bag valve mask ventilation is demonstrated in another video. If no mask is available and you're not willing to give mouth-to-mouth -mouth resuscitation, continue CPR without rescue breathing. Alternate chest compressions and rescue breathing using a ratio of 30 compressions to two ventilations until the patient recovers, help arrives, or resuscitative efforts are terminated. Minimize interruptions to chest compressions for activities such as checking the pulse and analyzing the cardiac rhythm. Pay particular attention to this immediately before and after a shock is delivered. When two or more rescuers are available, the second rescuer should kneel on the opposite side of the patient so there's no delay for switching sides. 
One person can do compressions while the other does rescue breathing. To minimize fatigue, which can lead to inadequate compression rates or depth, switch chest compressors about every two minutes or after about five cycles of 30 compressions and two ventilations. As soon as a defibrillator is available, apply it to the patient. If the rhythm is ventricular fibrillation or pulseless ventricular tachycardia, the sooner the shock, the higher the likelihood of good outcome. If you have an automated external defibrillator, or AED, follow any prompts. Begin by removing all clothing from the patient's chest. An AED sets current levels automatically. Some AEDs also defibrillate automatically, but others prompt you to defibrillate. If you have a manual defibrillator and the patient is in ventricular fibrillation or pulseless ventricular tachycardia, immediately give one unsynchronized shock. Set energy level for biphasic defibrillators at the manufacturer's recommended level or, if this information isn't available, at the maximum recommended level. Set monophasic defibrillators at 360 joules. If the cardiac arrest is not witnessed and a defibrillator is already present on the scene, you can either apply the defibrillator immediately or first begin chest compressions and then apply the defibrillator after a period of chest compressions. The recommended sequence of these actions has varied over time. Place defibrillating paddles or AED pads between the clavicle and the second intercostal space along the right sternal border and over the fifth or sixth intercostal space at the apex of the heart, usually about the anterior axillary line. With conventional defibrillator paddles, use gel pads or conducting paste. AED pads incorporate conductive gel. Only one initial shock is now advised, after which chest compression is resumed. Resume compressions immediately after giving the shock. Recheck the rhythm every two minutes. If needed, give subsequent shocks at the same or higher energy level, maximum 360 joules, or 2 to 4 joules per kilogram in children. If the patient remains in cardiac arrest, continue chest compression, ventilation, and provide advanced cardiac life support, including drug therapy when appropriate. If there's a definite pulse at any time during CPR, stop chest compressions, give one breath every 5 to 6 seconds, and recheck the pulse every 2 minutes. Transport the person to a hospital after successful resuscitation for post-cardiac arrest care. The decision to terminate resuscitation is complex. It should usually be made by the most senior clinician involved. The decision is based on the likelihood of survival with meaningful neurologic outcome or, if organ donation is the goal, the likelihood of the patient surviving cardiac arrest. Among the important factors are the duration of arrest, for example, the duration of resuscitation, how long arrest lasted before resuscitation, what interventions have already been tried, such as defibrillation and or drugs, how quickly more advanced interventions could be available, the patient's age and underlying health, and whether hypothermia is involved. <laughs>